Hello there, welcome to the Headhunter Show with me, Laban Cleave, coming to you from Kofisi, right here in Nine West, our partners in this Headhunter series. Always a pleasure to have you on board, and thank you for the feedback that we we'll continue to receive uh, on our social media platforms as well. And speaking about social media and technology, uh, we're talking about advancement in technology, particularly in the HR circles. Here we're looking at new ways of hiring, new ways of recruitment as well, uh, performance management and what have you, all on social media and also looking at the tools that are used actually on this. We'll be speaking to a technological expert, that's none other than Moses Kimimbaro, who's the CEO and co-founder at Dot Survey East Africa. Just give us an overview of what exactly is happening in the technological space and how to help you get ahead of be ahead of the curve, for instance, in ensuring that you can actually get headhunted. Well, join me on this in welcoming Moses to the show. Karibu sa. Asante. Great. So uh, let's go um, start um, from, you know, just give us a context uh, in who Moses is. Uh, of course, um, in the Kenyan circles and the regional circles, many will identify with you uh, out of your work with uh, Dot Savvy as well. But uh, for international audience, um, I'm sure after they Google you, maybe you'd want to give context onto that. Great. So thanks so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. And uh, well, who am I? So my name is Moses Kamibaro. I run a company called Dot Savvy. It's a digital agency that's actually in our 20th year in 2022. Um, what we do at Dot Savvy is we work with a variety of clients, both in the public and private sector. Uh, primarily around all things digital, so whether it's building a website, um, managing their social media, doing digital advertising to help them sell products and services, uh, and anything in between, including, of course, you know, providing elements of uh, HR technology on some of the platforms that we provide them with. Um, on the side, I've been also a blogger, as you know, for a long time, I think over 15 years. Uh, where I essentially talk about my passion, which is all things technology in this part of the world, in Kenya and East Africa. And most recently, I also started a podcast, which is actually doing quite well. So maybe one day I'll also have you as a For guest sure. on my podcast. <laughs> I look forward to that. Yeah. Uh, beyond that, over the last 10, 15 years, I've worked in also other interesting organizations. Um, uh, companies like NASPAS, which is one of the largest media businesses globally. And I was involved in setting up what was the first... Um, big attempt to build a classifieds platform called Dealfish. That business subsequently changed and became what we know today as Gigi after you know going through OLX and then becoming Gigi because of a transition in ownership. Uh, I also had the opportunity to work with Opera, if you know Opera Mini. Mm -hmm. I was involved in their advertising sales business for digital uh, advertising. And uh, prior to that, I was also involved in a company called Inmobi which is a global uh, digital advertising platform, primarily focused on mobile. And there I was responsible for advertising sales in um, East and West Africa. Mm -hmm. Wow, great interesting profile there, I must say. And in a largely 360, I'll say, in terms of modest technology uh, and what we'll actually talk about. Uh, we're particularly keen on uh, From Your Lens. And with over two decades, we're just trying to look at companies helping out um, startups and helping companies grow as well. Um, from your big picture perspective, what are you seeing in terms of, you know, the HR trends in technology, you know, new ways of hiring and what have you? So, again, based on the fact that I've, you know, had a, run a business in the tech space now for 20 years and, of course, been professionally employed now for probably 30, I think we've seen a lot of changes in how the whole process of recruitment works today. Um, historically, as you may imagine, when I was you know, coming into the workplace, we would uh, uh, print out our CV, put it in an envelope mm -hmm. and uh, you know, deliver it <laughs> to uh, potential Except employers or yeah. put it in the post. Yeah. Um, subsequently, um, beyond that, you know, we now started having a scenario where you'd send your emails out to potential you know, um, uh, you know, companies that might be looking for somebody like you when you saw their ad in the newspaper, so mm -hmm. email became the case. And then more recently, we see platforms like LinkedIn, where you know they act as almost a virtual CV, uh, where you can come in and, and see uh, somebody's credentials and then actually proactively reach out to them and potentially recruit them. And then also in terms of what we do nowadays with our clients, you know, there are probably two sides to this, where uh, quite often because we manage quite a few corporates, you know, banks, insurance companies on their websites, 
we help them post their job ads. We also have something called an applicant tracking system. That's something you build into your website so you can sort of create a more efficient workflow between you know receiving 200 CVs a day in a structured way, being able to sift and sort out the recruitment process. So you find many of these systems will have elements of artificial intelligence and machine learning so that they can essentially surface the right candidate for you using that content. Um, and you see companies online that do this a lot, you know, the big, you know, the Googles, the Microsofts. If you ever go to their career sections, you'll see they have some sort of applicant tracking system built in. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the flip side, you know, it's kind of um, working with organizations and clients um, where we're able to use uh, technology platforms like the LinkedIn's and so forth so we can amplify um, those particular positions. We can, again, use those platforms to ensure that they are able to surface uh, the right candidates. So what we're seeing over this sort of 20, 30 years is moving from a paper-based process, moving to email, mm -hmm. and then looking at, you know, recruitment platforms, you know, applicant tracking systems, and now, of course, dedicated platforms like LinkedIn, which allow you to in a very precise way, um, find the right candidates for your offerings, or rather the positions you have in your organization. Mm -hmm. It's something yeah. we were discussing earlier. It's interesting to note that, you know, on the tabs that, you know, organizations have that the beat about, you know, vacancies or work for us tab or, you know, um, slots open for work, you know, it's, uh, you're seeing an increase or you're seeing kind of, a, kind of an increase into the number of clicks as opposed to the landing pages, the home page and what have you. Exactly. It's such yeah. an interesting and peculiar fact that mm -hmm. um, because we handle a lot of corporate websites, mm -hmm. we see that more often than not, the second most popular page or section on our website will tend to be the HR or careers page. Mm -hmm. So from the home page, the second page, usually when you open up your Google Analytics, that is the number two most popular. And in some instances can even be more popular depending yeah. on the nature of the brand or business. So if you're highly desirable, you know, let's say you're Safaricom and all, uh, you will find that an incredible number of people come to their career pages. And in fact, one of the, the beefs that I have with some of my clients is that we need to spend more time and effort mm -hmm. enriching the content that sits on that page because yeah. it's a way of selling your organization to high quality talent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a way of telling the story of what it's like working there. So yeah. it shouldn't just be a, a page saying no vacancies at this point in time or, mm -hmm. you know, expired positions, but rather it should be a rich and engaging uh, section of your website that sort of serves to essentially position you as the right employer for that potential candidate. Mm -hmm. Another thing we're seeing in the region, and I, th I think I speak more from the technology side of things, is that um, we're seeing a very high appetite for people who are, shall I call it, switched on around digital and technology uh, careers. As you know, um, organizations like Microsoft, uh, Google, and others have set up development centers in this part of the world. I think the other day I was talking to somebody, and I think the television Microsoft has is about 600 people. You have people like Candela who are outsourcing, you know, uh, technology services globally from Nairobi, from Kigali. Um, and within the technology space, what we're seeing, and of course Safaricom is a major employer of people in our space, is uh, there's almost like a massive push towards uh, recruiting um, what I'd call tech-first employees. But also um, in terms of we are seeing a shift where a lot of high quality talent is moving towards many of these international companies. Now, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that as a business locally, whether you're a startup or a well-established local uh, brand or business in the country, these are the people that you're competing with for talent. So how do you package yourself digitally mm -hmm. to be as appetizing or as interesting as some of the global players in this space? So, you know, it's becoming really a, a talent of sorts and technology is very much at the core of how you're able to achieve that more effectively. Yeah. Um, of course, for our audience who might not understand this, I mean, Microsoft, um, the Facebooks of this world, and uh, IBMs are on a talent war uh, with the local software developers. And we'll come Correct. to that, to how that space is it. Because I know, you know, you can just see movement. One, <laughs> the CEO has been appointed here, and the CEO has actually moved on this side, but we'll come to that. So what, what then would um, HR professional and head of ICT, head of HR and head of ICT, do with that kind of information that you've given them regarding their landing pages, their LinkedIn profiles, and really how, do they, how, how to position for jobs that they're recruiting for and how to attract the best yeah. talent? Yeah. I think we're seeing that, um, again, you know, let's talk a little bit about the pandemic in this context, right? There's a phrase that has become very 
uh, said, possibly over said or overused, which is digital transformation. Mm -hmm. And digital transformation in a nutshell is the idea that as an organization, you don't change what you do, but you change how you do it. Mm -hmm. And you become digital in many of these um, processes you have in your organization that you, you know, would use. So case in point, we as a company at Dotsavi have been working now for over two and a half years remotely. From the very early phase of the pandemic, we knew we needed to shut down the office because we were a relatively small office. People were very compact in there and it just wouldn't have been safe for any one of us. So we started working remotely. Um, we had to learn a new work process of doing so. Mm -hmm. And now it has become our norm. We still have an office where some of our team members go occasionally, and that's how we're operating as a business to date. Mm -hmm. But what has happened as a result of the pandemic, many organizations, large and small, including the largest people like Safaricom, had to work from home. And many organizations that work in our space, even digital marketing today, some of them still don't have, some of them actually gave up their offices. Mm -hmm. They decided that they were going to go into a complete digital workflow. They meet as a team maybe once or twice a month in a co-working space like Coffee yeah. And then they come together in a boardroom and can see each other, talk to mm -hmm. each other, have a bit of camaraderie. And that is how they now interact. But pretty much the entire workflow has changed. So when you look at how organizations are operating today, you find a scenario where I was recently, recently talking to our, our head of people and culture in our organization. And we started debating this conversation about adopting a hybrid model. Yeah. Right? Do we start having people come in two, three times Once a week? A week. Uh -huh. uh, get that face time, get that, yes. you know, brainstorms feel brainstorms. stronger when yeah. you have proximity in mm -hmm. person. Yeah. And, you know, he sort of whispered in my ear that that's an interesting idea, but what I'm hearing from the team is that some people, if you were to actually decide to go full time back to the office, may actually seek to resign. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to yeah. say is that when yeah. you talk about the Microsofts and the Googles and the yeah. IBMs, we're also grappling with these issues post-pandemic, mm -hmm. is you have a workforce that is telling you, mm -hmm. in no uncertain terms, yeah. if you do not give me the option to work from home or generally work on my own terms, yeah. I may consider working for another employer who offers that. Mm -hmm. And coming back to your earlier question, mm -hmm. the question then becomes that organizations now have to adapt to their workforce mm -hmm. rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. Because with all the options available to them and the fact that you know, employers of choice, so the kind of employers that and brands that people want to work for, the biggest names, are saying to their workforces that, you know what, it doesn't have to be nine to five in the office. Mm -hmm. Come in a couple of days, come in when needed. Mm -hmm. We're going to be flexible and accommodate you. Or in some instances, some people are telling us that, you know, I work in an organization that has been very clear that they do not intend to see me in person. Mm -hmm. All they care about is what I deliver day to day. Yeah. So work becomes not a place you go to, but mm -hmm. a thing that you do, yeah. which is what it should always have been, yeah. rather than somebody hovering behind you to see yes, what you're what doing. You're doing yeah. And you measure productivity from that point of view. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, when we transition to a virtual scenario, mm -hmm. we found that there were many instances where we had to kind of adapt new policies. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, we had a work from home policy that we need to expand mm -hmm. to cater for the fact that when you're working remotely, because we provide you with access to internet, right. we provide you with um, airtime for your phone so you can operate remotely, mm -hmm. clients can call you, you can call clients. We had to expand that policy to accommodate that new reality. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, between 9 and 5 p.m., your phone must be on and available and reachable, right? you must be in a position where we can only measure productivity by you going to the project management platform so that we can see that you're checking off your tasks. Mm -hmm. We meet only once a week for status yeah. because we use technology to track productivity. And it becomes very clear very fast when somebody's not doing what they need to do. Because all you're doing is you're checking off the boxes, you're looking at the timelines, you expect a productive outcome by a certain day and a time, and if it's not there, that's how I measure your productivity. It's no longer about how many times I called you in a day or whether you're sending me 20 emails. I'm looking at the outputs, you know. So organizations need to start thinking about workflows that are based on technology. Yeah. The more extreme type of scenario is, and something that we considered at some point, mm -hmm. is you have now softwares that you have your team installed yeah. that has a camera that opens your camera and it, yeah. it does screenshots as yeah. well of somebody being productive as they work through the day. Yeah. Now that is, get some could say, digital <laughs> surveillance, which... Yeah becomes part of digital, digital privacy. privacy. And we're yeah. seeing cases emerging globally where yes. organizations that have these practices as a condition for you to work for them remotely um, are now sort of under pressure like, why are you having screenshots or seeing by the camera what somebody's doing day to day? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a mix of 
you want to have some level of productivity management or monitoring, but it should not also at the same time exceed the boundaries and become an issue of surveillance. Mm -hmm. You know, where you're now sort of um, interfering with somebody's privacy and ability to be comfortable at work. Okay. And there are many, many other things yeah. that go on and on in this sort of situation. But organizations need to, post-pandemic, through digital transformation, mm -hmm. adapt their work processes and policies to accommodate this new reality. Great insights. Please, don't go too far because I uh, was taking a few notes for the next questions, but I've decided to pause and uh, wait until you join us after the break. So stay tuned. Hello there, welcome back to The Headhunter uh, with me, Laban Cliff. Of course, having the tech in the house, that's another Moses Kimimbaro just talking to us about the landscape and how it is out there. The, the tools, um, I'm keen for you to just throw out the top of mind tools that organizations can use to actually track, measure that work from home uh, bit so that they're actually up to date in what they're doing. I mean, some of this stuff doesn't have to be super complicated, okay. right? There's a, obviously, there's many cloud-based um, uh, project management yeah. and collaborative tools. So you have things yeah. like Slack. We use Slack. Yeah. Yeah. Slack allows us to have a sort of collaborative work process. Uh, we're very big on Google uh, Workspace, you yeah. know, so we're able to, you know, spreadsheets and uh, collaborative documents and yeah. so forth. We, we use that in the cloud. Um, from a financial services standpoint, we, you know, in accounting, we use something called uh, Zero. Mm -hmm. We've been on that, I think, for over 10 years. So all our accounting lives in the cloud. And of course, the payroll and uh, other systems of that nature connect to that. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things we're very fortunate about is in the early phase of that transition, we were already working in the cloud. We already moved away from on-premise to cloud-based systems, including an HR system we use called Nifty. So. Mm -hmm. Nifty is a locally based product. Somebody, um, or a company developed that locally. It's compatible with all our standard uh, Kenyan procedures and laws. You can apply for your leave. You can track your leave days. You can see your performance management reporting. Mm -hmm. And without that stuff, we can't really keep a track on what's happening within the organization. Mm -hmm. And then you have platforms like Asana for your project management. Um, we have another one called Trello that mm -hmm. we also use for project management. So when you bring all those pieces together, and especially when they're able to talk to each other yeah, uh, using what we call APIs, mm -hmm. then you can have sort of a more like an integrated approach yeah. to how you, you do your sort of your virtualization yeah. of your business processes. Okay. Culture should be very important to you guys. Like, you know, we're just discussing about, you know, the whole suit and tie thing. You know, for techies, I'm sure you can show up in shirt, yeah. t-shirt, jeans. Tone jeans. Yeah. That thing, lock tattoos, the works. I mean, man. that the <laughs> so, Yeah. Well, the space that we're in may be big on air without, you know, it, it may, may be a bit different. So I'm just looking at the culture with that work from home and really post-COVID. Are you able to keep track? And I'm speaking to you also as, as, a, as, a, as a business leader, as a business owner. You know, you, uh, are you able to keep track? Of course, the FaceTime can help, but, you know, the monthly FaceTime. But um, do you see that as a risk that, you know, you might just have guys who are not really aligned to the, um, the, the yeah. corporate culture? I think what has happened also is, and this is something that I don't think any business can say has not happened, is that when people are in a physical place together, mm -hmm. the culture feels stronger. Yeah. There's a clarity of what's going on, how we work, who we are, what we are all about. Yeah. We saw as we recruited people during the pandemic and beyond yeah. that they're, because we work remotely, mm -hmm. some of our employees have never met physically, even mm -hmm. as we speak, but they worked yeah. together for the last eight months. Wow. Because again, yeah. and this is a funny thing, yeah. many of our clients have now become the biggest culprits of, of Microsoft Teams and Zoom and the likes. Mm -hmm. Clients who you never anticipated would want you to meet in person now insist on meeting on Zoom. So what that has done is that we no longer commute out to meetings the way we used to. We do it all virtually. Now, what has happened, as you rightly pointed out, is that we have seen, to some extent, a bit of an erosion of that core culture. But what helps is that the people who've been in the organization pre-pandemic and pre-remote working and the likes 
become kind of your culture owners, meaning that even as the new people come in, the practices, the way we do things, they become kind of the people who are able to kind of uh, inculcate that behavior in the rest of the team. Number two, we've always had a culture where we don't like to hover over our people. Mm -hmm. I tend to think that everyone is a walking, talking, fully formed adult, mm -hmm. meaning that you want to have people who are self-accountable, people who know what needs to be done, uh, and more importantly, don't need somebody with a, with a stick behind them to get the work done. Yeah. So my view has always been that, look, you've given the mandate, you have a job description, these are the clients we serve, this is the work that we do, get on with it and get it done. Now, of course, there's a risk there. And I'm going to share with you an anecdote mm -hmm. from our time uh, at, 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 uh, during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, there's a person who worked with us at one point where we discovered <laughs> After we noticed the drop in productivity, and of course, as we lost business, we had to downsize down, a little yeah, bit. We yeah. lost about five people during that period. Mm -hmm. um, we came to learn later that they were not showing up for client meetings, they were not available, and so forth. And this was a person who we actually recruited uh, just before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they really understood our culture well yeah. enough. Yeah. But what we then learned later is mm -hmm. this person had actually taken another position, uh -huh. which is also remote, yes. and was concurrently doing two jobs. Two jobs. Uh -huh. Now, those are some of the risks you encounter yes. in these moments. Yeah. And the line of work that we do, we also like to say that in many markets, and not just Kenya, people have a tendency to have a side hustle. Mm -hmm. So you're virtual, you're a graphic designer, yeah. you have Mama Mboga coming to you, you might yes. have a corporate working with you as well. But my view is always very simple. If these are the tasks and the hours available in a day, and we have a, an idea of the threshold that is required for you to deliver that work, if you're working till midnight because you're working with two companies, that's not my problem. My problem is, is the work on time? Is it on quality? And is it delivered in a way that is collaborative and inclusive of the rest of the team so that we deliver a good product? Mm -hmm. What you do in your extracurriculars is not my biggest concern, but what you do yeah. during the hours given and assigned yeah. For what we do as a business is what is critical. And for you, put it as nine to five, basically. It could be nine, nine to, five. to five. It could be well, under. I mean, I start my day typically as early as seven. Yeah. I'll go all the way till midnight. It's midnight, not uncommon. Yeah. And many yeah. of my colleagues will do the same. Yeah. But I feel like it's got to be that sort of, you know, self-governing ethics or morals mm -hmm. around what is right and wrong, mm -hmm. but also knowing that you are responsible for certain results, which ultimately is what you get paid for. Sure. You know. And I yeah. think another thing we also learned maybe the hard way is that some people need. Um, on occasion, somebody to sort of check in on them and see what's going on. Case in point, this morning I had one of my colleagues, you know, request um, a leave, kind of unexpectedly, and yet today was a full working day. So I had to pick up the phone and ask him what's happening, what's going on. Oh, you have a medical issue. Understood. Yeah. It's okay. Just yeah. go ahead. Yeah. But I had to get that leave application yes. yeah. from the system to, to know that there's see. a problem. Yeah. Sometimes I'm seeing somebody's not quite responsive, and I'll call out and say, "Is everything okay?" Oh, I don't have power at home. That's why I have to come back to you. Yeah. So there's got to be also an element of proactivity True. to reach out to people in that kind of a work environment yeah. to see how they're doing and what's going on. Sometimes it's just a phone call like, hey, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. Are you okay? Is are you fine? well? Yeah. Last week you had a bit of a cold. Mm -hmm. uh, did you get over that? Mm -hmm. And you will not believe that that five-minute call has so much yes. value yeah. in also building that culture. The fact that they get that the sense course, of somebody yeah, cares, cares about me, about somebody's yeah. looking out for me. It's not just about producing the work yeah, like a factory. Yeah, yeah. But there's an element of empathy, there's an element of follow-up to make sure people are okay. And equally so, our people and culture manager also does that sort of outreach every few days. Are you guys okay? Are you fine? Is there any issue? You know, oh, you're having a problem with the computer, do we need to get that sorted out? You know, so there's that continuous push and pull so that people don't become too distant from the core of what the business is. It's really great, um, especially for business leaders right now to actually uh, get because I feel like this, first of all, work from home policy is really at the core. Uh, finance is battling that beat of, okay, are we investing in the right systems or in the right uh, you know, tools for people to actually um, support that? Um, some systems and tools are becoming obsolete. I think you mentioned some of uh, the names that the, the kind of... Um, new and maybe not too expensive as what you know other um, uh, technology uh, platforms would give but then again how do you make that transition you know you've had businesses relying on these you know um, outdated tools for a while you know and it becomes very difficult to actually move on so I'm just trying to look at making the business case to your board your chairman 
uh, regarding uh, these tools that you actually need to inculcate because it's not really what the organization wants, but it's also what is happening across the yeah. board. And that's why you'll find that platforms like Slack have become so popular yeah. because what they did is when they built those platforms, they looked at what consumers were happy using or, you know, in fact, enjoying to use, which was, could you create a Facebook-like experience mm -hmm. around a business platform or yeah. system? Mm -hmm. Could you create something that felt, you know, more like Twitter or LinkedIn within your business organization? Yeah. And what you found is that historically, a lot of these enterprise-based applications, your SAPs, your uh, oracles and so forth were never really uh, driven around creating a fantastic consumer experience. So more about uh, historically getting the job done. I need accounting done, it does that. I need HR management, it does that. But many of the social media platforms that came after started to create a more customer, more consumer-centric user experience. Mm -hmm. And then many of them started to now incorporate a lot of the, the look and feel and the sort of the experience that people had become accustomed to, not just on desktop, but even on mobile devices when they're using Facebook, when they're using LinkedIn and so forth. So in that sense, I think the consumer or the employee or the workforce pushed organizations to start adopting platforms mm -hmm. that mimicked or created user experiences that actually got people to use them. Mm -hmm. Back in the day when we were starting our business, we used to build something called an intranet. Yeah. The internet in the, you know, 20 years ago is what today is what Slack, Slack is. is yeah. But Slack had to become very user-driven or focused in the way it was experienced so that users could actually adopt it. So user experience has become a major factor. I think what they call HR experience yeah. um, around platforms and how you deliver services to them is important. I mean, back in the day, we'd have people fill out a printout of what we call the leave application form. This morning when my colleague needed to take the half day off to get the medical attention, he went online, he picked out his day, he put okay. his details, he, he put it as an annual leave as opposed to you know, sick leave, which is why I was a bit concerned, like, yeah. what is this about? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, he applied for it and I got a notification that, you know, he needed to go, you know, get medical attention. But if you don't build that into the way your business processes work, believe it or not, some of that can become impediments to people even yeah. staying in the organization if yeah. things are too manual or too yeah. technical or too, um, shall I call it, old school in mm -hmm. the way that you do things. And the modern workforce, by the way, um, we are seeing also across organizations that you need to be sensitive especially around that big topic nowadays of mental health, right? If you're yeah, not paying attention well. yeah. to that, and sometimes technology helps you sort of have your antennae up to hear and mm -hmm. feel that somebody's not okay, mm -hmm. um, you need to be using technology to start picking up those signs. Yeah. yeah. And well, of course, during well, pandemic, we saw that becoming a big issue. True, true. Yeah. Also, thank you so much. This has been enriching. Likewise. Really Such a pleasure. It. Thank you for having me. Kari Butela. Uh, that has been Moses Kerry Mimbaro, who has just been speaking to us about the whole technological evolution uh, right here in Kenya and in the region, and particularly to you as an employee or as a headhunter. How do you make sure that you can actually use technology to get ahead and be headhunted? My name is Lab and Cleve. Always a pleasure to have you on board. See you again next time.